Let's do it. It's go time. Welcome to Go Time, your source for diverse discussions from all around the Go community. Thanks to our partners for helping us bring you awesome pods each and every week. Check them out at fastly.com, fly.io, and typesense.org. Okay, here we go. Hello, 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 all you wonderful gophers out there. Welcome back to Go Time. This week on this episode, we are going to be discussing the tools and editors that we love. Joining me for this awesome episode are my co-hosts, John and Matt. How are you doing today, John? I am doing well, Chris, and this is absolutely the first time I've answered that question. Yup, the first time. There were no problems whatsoever. Uh, how are you doing today, Matt? Yeah, very good, thank you. Um, I've had a lovely day so far, although I'm a little bit under the weather, um, but still, oh, nice no. to be here. Well, yeah. we're, we're very glad you could, you could still join us today. Thank you. And joining the panel today, we have a repeat guest, uh, Andy Walker. How are you doing today, Andy? I'm uh, I'm good. I mean, right off the bat, I'll say I'm I'm the source of all of your of all of your problems. <laughs> I've delayed this broadcast like <laughs> twice now, but now everything seems to be good. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing good. It's, I'm actually doing great. Fantastic. Uh, and to you know, start off, this episode uh, was actually suggested by one of our listeners out there. So uh, thank you, Steve Nicklin, for sending in this uh, suggestion. And as a reminder to all of our listeners, we do take requests. Uh, and I believe you can go to the gotime.fm website and submit a request there for an episode you would like us to do. All right. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, so before we actually get into the actual tools and editors and things that we love, I thought it'd be a good way to start the episode to talk about how we actually find the tools oh, that we eventually wind up loving. Because I think there's you know tons of podcast or many podcasts like this where it's like, oh, this specific person's tools and all that. But for people starting out, how do you actually go finding tools and things like that? Because uh, it, it, it can be a bit, bit challenging. And I know we all have our own individual ways. So uh, who wants to start uh, with just, a, I guess the prompt would be, you know, how do you find tools to do things uh, that you currently don't have a tool for? Oh, it's like the hardest. It's really hard. Like I, I'm routinely surprised, honestly, by like tools that have been around forever, right? That I've just now like discovered. But like a lot of the time, you know, I'm a pretty big command line jockey. So like a lot of what I do is like trolling through kind of like, Google, like with certain keywords, like, you know, CLI, I, I throw the, the CLI one in there a lot because like, that's the kind of like the ergonomics that are like the most important to me and, you know, GitHub search, but all, oftentimes like I, I end up coming back to Reddit, right? Like, cause like it's, there's just this huge collection of people with very strong opinions about how everything should be done. Right. And so, yeah, it's kind of a combination of those two. What are you going to do when Reddit goes away? I don't know, honestly, and I've been thrown for a loop because, like, mm. I was one of the users of those apps that just went under. And so now I'm just kind of like, oh, do I capitulate and deal with the... <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. But yeah, I mean, like, it's still pretty well indexed by Google. And so, yeah, that's a good place to look for it. Like, the sysadmin and um, really any of the... Like, if it's a particular programming language tool, like, that la programming language is subreddit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I usually wait for there to be a thing I need to do. Or if I notice I'm doing something a lot, I'm like, hmm, I feel like there's probably a thing that will help me here. But I find the Go newsletter to be really quite helpful. That often has tools in there written in Go, but they tend to be like people solving their own problems, which tend to be the best kind of tools. And so I discover a lot that way. And I don't think that's going to disappear. When you're trying those tools, Matt, how do you like... How do you keep yourself so you remember them and use them enough early on that they actually stick? Because I think that's one of my issues is I'll install some new tool and I'm like, I know this would be great. But then by the time I go to like need it down the road, I've like forgotten that I even have it installed or how it works yeah. or anything. Yeah, I just don't use it again. I just use it once. <laughs> okay. I think Go is particularly good for at least like CLI stuff. I mean, obviously that's a horse that's been beaten to death many times. But, you know, there are a, a small group of people and, you know, or companies, even some professionally, right, that are concentrating on that and kind of refreshing that. Like, you know, um, Charm Bracelet is one. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. They do a popular, um, you know, CLI kind of 
suite of tools called, um, well, there's several of them. There's Bubble Tea, Gum, VHS. They're all really high quality, all really well written in Go. Um, you know, I've hung out with on their Slack and kind of I've done some contributions myself. But those are really nice because they lend themselves really well to like kind of consistently styled like ergonomic tools, right? And like so, there's and there's been kind of a research surgence in that. And so I guess when we get to some specific tools, I can talk about that a little. But I think Go is really good place. Yeah. And- those charm bracelet tools tend to be really quite attractive as well. Like they put a lot of time into making them a joy to use. And honestly, like we don't give that enough credit. It's like, sometimes you think, Oh, I just need it to do the thing. But if it's, I don't know. I I certainly like appreciate when tools look good as well. How how about you? Like, does that make a difference to you? Do you feel like you're more likely to use a tool if you've got a sort of beautiful experience? Oh, for sure. I mean, like I'm, as I've said pretty much every time I've been on here, like I'm a closet like design and um, UX fanboy, you know? And so like, I'm like always tweaking my fonts and like my, I did my own color scheme because I, you know, whatever. And so yeah, it's, I think ergonomics, visual ergonomics are like really important and even just aesthetics, right? And they've certainly spent a lot of time on that. Yeah. Is that why your hair's so good? Mm, it is. Yeah. I think that's why most editors probably... Like very early in the setup process, they show you the theme selection as like something you can do. And I know people have different opinions on whether or not those color themes actually add a ton of value or not. But like, I feel like part of it is just people wanting to express themselves and like choosing the color theme that it's not just about which one actually works well. It's also like which one is colors that I like that express like my personality or whatever. Well, I mean, you're customizing your your knife or your car or whatever. You know, there's I know people that are like really into like pocket knives or whatever, and they get like these really fancy kits and they trick them out or whatever. And it's kind of like that. I mean, the, your editors and whatnot are your tools, right? And so you just kind of like, oh, that feels, yeah, that feels like me. Yeah. Solarized dark, you know, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Rob Pike doesn't use a fixed width font when he codes. That blew my mind and uh, I've tried it and yeah, it doesn't make sense. Well, it's either him or <laughs> Russ that's responsible for my like anti-syntax highlighting crusade. My, it's not personal. Oh, really? Uh, I don't really crusade, but... No. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have syntax highlighting? No, not at all, no. I think that's a lie. Okay, he, he doesn't say it's a lie. I, I, I mean, it depends on what you call that. Like, I, I, I have some things in bold, but it's all black and white. Like, I use a little bit of bold, a little bit of italics, and a very small smattering of color for things like print verbs. That's about it. Mm. I, I think realistically that the bold, the italics, there's only a small amount that actually needs to have any sort of syntax highlighting right. to like get 99% of the value out of it. Landmarks. I think most of the colors are just you know, personal preference, whatever you like to see, and that's fine. But I, I like when you say there's no syntax highlighting, I kind of take like offense to that only because I'm like, there are certain things that uh, that are very useful to have like very clear in your editor. Yeah. I mean, like, okay. I, I will say I'll, I'll agree I don't use any really like very much color though, you know, like, um, certainly I don't like colorize any of my syntax elements because it eventually it just becomes like, if everything is special, nothing is special, but I've already talked about this and I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> sidetrack the podcast. I think I also take offense because I, when I first started coding, when I was very young, it was on like notepad and windows, which had just black and white, nothing else. And I know my experience there, like having a little bit of syntax highlighting would have went a long way compared to just okay, I've got just black and white. It's monospaced font, but it's it's still black and white. Mm. Well, I mean, I think my argument is also that you sh- it's not that you should have no color. It's that your color should be a little bit more important. Like for me, like the places where I want to use color and I can't, but I would, are like things like I would love to be able to have colors that represent, for example, like something escaping to the heap or like something that's a particularly inefficient from a language analysis perspective. Not so much that this is a string and this is a method. Like, I don't care. Like, I can see that, right? Like, or I can highlight over it and get, you know, if I need to. So this this makes me wonder, uh, oh, first, what editor do you use? So I'm primarily, a, a, right now, I'm primarily in Visual Studio Code. I was a long, long, long time Vim user. And mostly, at the end of the day, I left Vim because, well, first of all, I mean, I don't want to get too close to my unpopular opinion just yet. But first of all, like it was a lot of maintenance. Secondly, there's a very hard limitation imposed by having a fixed width grid of characters that you can simply just never escape. And there are layers of meaning and there are like, and there are layers of context and information 
that simply having fonts that can be different size can make a big difference in like, but Vim kind of forces you to be austere. Like any graphical element that's out of place is screen real estate being wasted and a lot of it. Right. So, and nothing, everything is equal. So that's what made it very hard. That's one of the reasons I switched over to Visual Studio Code, despite the fact that like I was fighting like 20 years of muscle memory. Mm. Yeah. Do you use the Vim bindings in VS Code? I don't. I, so I, I, when I started using Visual Studio Code, it was still pretty new. And the Vim bindings were just, it was not good at all. It was a terrible experience. And it just felt like a hack. And so I was it's like... It's a terrible experience, but that's because it's copying Vim. Right. Well, <laughs> and that's, that's an opinion. <laughs> but like... Is it? And so I was just like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to... I mean, I certainly didn't want to like, at first I was like, I should just go native, right? I should live off the land. I should learn the key bindings that are everywhere. And then very quickly I was like, no way. Like, and I, I ended up going with kind of like a corded system where, you know, it's, there's a mnemonic for it. Yeah. So that's kind of where I am now. Yeah. With Vim, it, the difficult thing is when I, I cause I, I've never used Vim and sometimes I'll either screen share with somebody. I use pop pop.com which is kind of really cool collaboration tool it's kind of like screen hero actually i think it is screen hero like it was literally the same people Mm -hmm. like screen hero got bought by slack and then it just i don't know it's in slack somewhere kind of Uh, but pop.com is uh, an alternative which is great for pair programming like you both get a different cursor you can take turns typing you can sort of just type but if i'm in someone else's editor and suddenly it's vim you know I'm just trying to type in simple funk hello or something and I've jumped to the end of the line, I've changed the font and I've deleted all the files on my computer. Yeah. (laughs) So it's like not very portable. So there's something nice about when, you know, it's nice when you type, it's nice when you press a key on the keyboard, that letter that you've pressed goes on the telly on the screen. That that's quite a nice feature, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, but that's really the only thing that's portable at the end of the day. Like, once you the keys come out when you type them and you know that was kind of the big my big difficulty in switching because you know okay yeah i can type but how do i move around like i i really hate picking my hand up like off while i'm typing and like having to scroll i mean i I kind of put up with it now yeah but like he's such a hero (laughs) but like even just moving backwards and forwards like one word right like that's not consistent between a lot of editors i mean maybe it is now but like Anything beyond just I click here and I type here, which I consider to be like the hunt and peck of programming, is like not portable. So, yeah, it's true. I've seen, I sometimes when pair programming, I'll see people do things and stuff's happening, and I've no idea how they've just done that just with their keys or just very quickly. But sometimes it's like it does seem like magic. I feel I feel like that's like an interesting tool idea. Is like some i think like 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 a language server protocol but for collaboration so that you can be using your own editor and then like the underlying system just synchronizes the buffers so that you're you know editing in the same space but like someone can be in vs code and someone else can be in neovim and someone else can be in emacs or you know goland or whatever you could all be editing the same underlying stuff that would be a real cool tool i think i feel like that's going to be like all the chat protocols we have where everybody will make their own and We'll just every time somebody tries to make a universal one, we just end up with another proprietary one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know because I feel like language server protocol probably gives us a good base for how to do this sort of thing. You know, I I know for me personally, when I first saw language server protocol come out, I was like, "That's silly. That why why would why do we need this? We don't need this. We don't need to have this thing." But I recently rebuilt my entire NeoVim config and just having like NeoVim has a language server protocol client built into it. So you just configure all of the bindings for go to definition and refers and all of that stuff once. And then you just like put a little single line of code in and then boom, it'll work for any language that has a language server protocol server for it. And I think that was like absolutely fantastic and that kind of revolutionized things. So I'm like, this is fantastic. So I think we could probably do the same thing if you know there was a big enough company like Microsoft that actually like pushed this kind of protocol or a consortium of people, you've got a consortium of editors online to be like, yes, we will all commit to doing this and kind of making this kind of collaboration underlying thing. You just put um, an LSP, right? 
Yeah, you just put it there. <laughs> like we we're so lucky that, that that landed at all. I think it's like it was a perfect storm. You know, because I like you, I was waiting for so long. I mean, like shoot the uh, uh, NeoVim LSP. It's like kind of just barely like recently, isn't it? Like actually like solid. So you know, I mean, I was using COC for a while and like all of those like wacky ones that like provided like bindings that kind of went through VS Code, sort of kind of. But um, yeah, I mean, like I think we're just like lucky to have LSP. So just put it in there, right? Let's just convince them to do that, right? It's yeah. I mean, that's already part of what it's supposed to do, I guess, right? Like it's be a central, you know. But yeah, yeah. All right. So do we have any other ways we like to to find tools? Like I can say one of the ways I've seen a lot of people do it is by watching like screencasts of people coding stuff. I think that's one of the reasons why they've become more popular than books in a lot of ways is that you're not just reading about how to do something. You're watching somebody use their tools and thinking like, oh, I'm seeing somebody who actually does this professionally, you know, do tricks. And you're like, I want to know how to do that trick. Because I know that's anytime I've done screen sharing anywhere, I always get questions about like, what's this? What's that? What tool are you using for this? And a lot of them aren't that crazy. I just don't think about, you know, if I was brand new, I wouldn't know what any of those tools are. So sometimes it's just watching developers and asking questions. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I get asked questions like, what font is that as well? Like, so, so if someone sees it and it goes back to that, like the interface, that, that way that we interface with, our, with these machines is very important to us. Yeah. And those fonts, like font sounds like a silly one, but I know in like some languages like um, JavaScript, the ligatures they have that, I think it's ligatures is what they're called, that like, they'll take like three equals or whatever the different things are and they'll like turn it into a special character. And while I don't necessarily prefer that, but I understand why some people would really like it. So I'm like, all right, cool. Like if you're a JavaScript developer and you like that, maybe that's a, something you, you need to choose. There's some Go ones as well. You do like the channel operators, the little da- hyphen with an angle bracket. It turns into an arrow. and We can thank Haskell for giving us those. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't use them, so I don't I don't know specifically which ones are out there. I just know some people really like them, and I'm like, okay, that's that's a reason to ask about that stuff. I mean, it, ergonomics are a big deal, right? Like, I mean, like that's kind of I guess part of what we're talking about today. But like, I mean, it it was. I think I was like I was like losing my mind because I thought I was like my vision was going bad because like I was struggling with plugging my MacBook into a monitor and like how fonts rendered depending on whether it was like retina or not. And then I finally read this article that mentioned that, hey, by the way, just so you know, MacBooks, they, they use non-integer scaling by default. And I was like, what? Right. And then I, <laughs> I like I noticed like that if I just made the screen, you know, less real estate, like everything became much more crisp and, you know, and the font choice can have a big, big part of that. Oh, that reminds me of a uh... I guess this is not like a, a, a tool specifically, but one of the things I did, I think about a year ago, is I used to have like, uh, I think I had a native 2K display. And then I was like, oh, okay, this like this works, but everything's just like a little bit fuzzy. And then I read this article that was like, actually, if you're going to be someone that stares at text all day, you should get a 4K monitor and then scale it down to 1080p, so HD. And that does like, Basically, it turns it into a retina display, and all of the text is super crisp. And since it's not like an in-between, it's like a whole number division, it doesn't have any weird fuzziness to it. And I did that, and I actually bought, like, I had a really good, like, 2K monitor, and I actually, like, got rid of that and got another 4K monitor and put it in 1080p, so I have double the setup. And it's just, it's been life-changing. It's been absolutely fantastic being able to just, like, see everything just so crisp on my desktop. That is exactly what I did. And it is exactly that article. The Tonsky one with the, like, the yellow background. I remember it vividly. Like I was like, life-changing. I bought the monitor immediately, the same one. I was just like, that was 4K at like 120 hertz, I think is, was like his recommendation or something. And yep, that's was, yeah. never look back. Yeah, I got I to gotta find that to put in the show notes. Yeah, I was going to say, we should put that in the show notes. I was going to say, when I first had the retina display, I wasn't like the images, the pictures and stuff are great, but... It was that sharpness of text that really made a difference. And it was like, yeah, again. And sometimes I'll have to, you know, I'll see that I'll use someone else's computer or even like screen sharing. You don't get the full resolution. And it's like fuzzy and stuff. And it's just, just yeah, it does something. Don't like it. When it hurts your eyes, like I, yeah. I mean, eye strain's real, man. And I'm, I'm in my early 40s now. So like, no, anything I can no. do. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, I mean, talking about that, are any of you interested in trying the new VR stuff from Apple whenever it comes out, given that, do you think it's going to have that eye strain? 
Mm. Not until they... Or have any of you used like the Oculus or any of the other VR stuff? I've used the uh, the PS, the PlayStation 1. And honestly, like as soon as I started looking at this, I'm like, I want a dev environment with this. Oh, yeah. You know, just to being able to... And I think, imagine... If, imagine even not just the windows all over the place, but imagine being able to actually visualize the programs in some way as they're running. Like, I feel like there's a whole world there where we're going to be able to actually get, you know, like when you watch old movies and there's like hackers, I think that's probably where we'll, we'll end up. And you'll know you finished the program because your tests will pass and the 3D cube that's spinning will complete and it'll all slot together nicely. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm really excited about that, to try that for dev. And it's 4K each eyeball. Normally, you've got 4K display. That's shared between both eyeballs. What a waste. This gives you 4K per eyeball. So that's lots of Ks. It's lots of pixels. <laughs> so like I can say, I agree with you that the first time I threw on VR, it was it was interesting because like, this would be cool to try. But I know that all, I used a lot of the early stuff that was like dev kits and like for like Oculus and then... Um, like the wireless, whatever the one they're on, the Quest or whatever it is, all those have resolutions so low that like, I'm like, there's no way I could code in this all day, but it is a really cool idea to like mess around with. So like, it would be nice to try the like really high resolution, see what that looks like. Oh, and when you were talking about visualizing stuff differently, I swear somebody did something where they had like something like Minecraft VR and they were doing something programming related with it. But I don't remember what it was. I'd have to go find the article. I think it's an exciting space. There was a talk, and this we'll will, will have to dig out and put in the show notes, but there was a talk at one of the Gopher Cons, and it was about visualizing Go code as it's running and visualizing concurrent code. Yeah. And you think, like, you know, I, I feel like it's valuable because it's quite abstract. Like, and actually, I'm fine with it being abstract, but I feel like even if it's just, again, just aesthetic or visually ergonomic it just looks beautiful i think it'd be a great to see your programs running physically in 3d space and imagine if you then also had your instrumentation data also fed into that grafana labs plug imagine <laughs> uh, imagine actually then seeing the when you've got like low latency and being able to actually see that heat up almost like a heat map visually around things you know if you think about profiling code and feeding that back into the developer experience. I feel like this is this is where we're headed. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of what, I think that's going to be the next level of where we're at. I mean, I think 3D components are, are great, It's but it's really all about like kind of information bandwidth and how much that we can take in. I remember I, at my very first job, part of the interview process, you know, they were asking me about like, you know, how I, you know, what I would do to design things. And I was like, well, and I went really off the rails with this because I wanted to impress them. And so I went like really off the rails with like this discussion on like, well, how you should base, you know, maybe we should consider basing error colors off of like the pallor of like unhealthy skin or something like that, because we're like tuned to it or, you know what I mean? Like, like saturating that information. I mean, now that's kind of wacky and, you know, whatever, but I do think that like multiple levels of of information about more than just like because right now we're i feel like we're very two-dimensional like it's very much like you know there is start position end position and it's either you know warning or whatever and it's very token based but you know there's not a lot out there that can say hey you know this section of your code's kind of slow right and you can kind of see it i think that's kind of like the next step yeah i think you're right though you're onto something with that that does sound yeah that sounds mad like I hope that stays in the podcast. Mm. <laughs> yeah, definitely <laughs> makes this makes stuff I say sound really good. Uh, but there is a lot like we do have. You know, we've evolved, and I don't really want to get into this now. I assume we all agree that we evolved as a species. We have like early humans, and uh, before that, even you know, needed to be able to navigate landscapes. We needed to be able to position ourselves and f- figure out where we were and stuff. I think like code, like syntax highlighting or the, like the mini map that you get in editors gives you, I feel like we're using that same kind of software or firmware or slushware. I don't know what it is. Floppyware. What is it? Moistware? Can't be. Wetware. Wetware, I believe is the. Wetware. Oh, is it? Yeah, that's got to. Cool. Uh, we're using that to help us navigate code. And I find that that is like, I've had people watch me coding that aren't in tech 
and they're just kind of blown away by how quickly I know where to go for things. And really, it's, it becomes kind of instinctive. And I feel like we are tapping into something like that. And so it's not to be ignored. Like, there are things that we can do that will make our lives easier. And usually it's going to tap into something very natural, probably. Well, yeah, it would kind of have to. Yeah. Because, I mean, I think that I read a study recently where it's basically said that, like, we're pretty much serial, at least in terms of, like, academic or, like, work-related tasks. Like, we really you really can't do more than one thing at one time easily. However, you know, there are a lot of these older systems that are constantly taking in information. You could reference somebody like Gavin DeBecker for that, like gift of fear, you know, whatever. And I think you can really, if you choose your cues and stuff carefully, you can convey more with less. Mm. Yeah. It's about, I wonder if we can move more into the subconscious and honestly, like, when we're designing software and thinking about it, it's very abstract. So we do get quite good at abstract thinking uh, as engineers. So, but that's not, that is, what is that even? That, what is physically going on in order for us to even be able to do that? I don't know. But I play the piano and I, I notice that it's very subconscious, the, the actual playing of it. And if during, uh, while I'm in the middle of playing something, if I think, what's the next thing I have to press? If I consciously try and think that, I have no idea. And then I sort of worry. I have to actually relax and just let it happen. So that's a really unusual uh, feeling. But but that also applies a lot to the code. Like a lot of what I'm doing when I'm coding is that kind of same thing. Instinctive and not conscious. Is it instinctive or is it like learned behavior? Because like I'm thinking, you said piano, but I'm even thinking on a keyboard if you asked me to like tell you all the letters on the keyboard, I couldn't unless I like tried to type and just thought about where my fingers went yeah. and then I could lay the entire keyboard out. But it's when I first learned how to program or how to type, I was actually looking and like paying attention to what I was doing. And then it's once you learn it, it becomes that it like becomes, it becomes, background. Yeah. I believe the term for it is procedural memory. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We'll just check that. But like, I feel like even with coding, there's, there's things that as you get more experienced in your editor, certain things that might be too much information at first become sort of background information that like it's easy to tell what file to go to or where to go or or even where to look for errors sometimes because you like there's small cues that your brain knows to filter out until it needs to actually look at it. I feel like that's kind of a tool in of itself as well, because I think kind of going after what you said, Andy, where it's kind of like, you know, we are very serial. Our consciousness is a very serial system, but we are very parallel. So the whole thing where you're like, yeah, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can do parallel things, but you can't really do parallel things consciously. So the more things that you can move toward the subconscious to kind of that, you know, procedural memory, the kind of automatic things that you do, the more that you'll be able to do at once. And I think that kind of links also into like the code mini maps and also the kind of low color syntax highlighting, where you're kind of just like going off of systems to be like, oh, I know where these things are. I don't have to think about them. They can actually increase your speed at coding uh, by a lot. And I think uh, a lot of times people will kind of just brush off those small little things that happen. Like even things as like, do you put the bracket on the same line or the next line that can really throw off those systems and really take a huge hit to your ability to actually move quickly throughout a code base. Like I always remember in my early days of Go and how big of a change Go Fumped made in the ability for people to just consume Go code. And I think in the early days, people were just kind of like, oh, okay, well, whatever. It just like formats. It's like, no, it formats it in a very specific, very regular way. So whenever you go into a Go code base, you're not getting annoyed because the brackets aren't where you think they're supposed to be or something like that. It's just like, oh, no, no, this is recognizable. So I can parse out all of the things I actually need to be paying attention to and all the noise kind of just fades into the background. Yeah. Well, you're actually speaking the same language now, right? Like, cause like speaking, so yeah, I remember there was so much gnashing of the teeth at the time, but like, you know, when you speak a language, it's more than just like the, the, the words, the, the vocabulary, right? It's like the percumbent, you know, rules of syntax and all that. And it, learning to speak something natively and speak the same like language is, is also about the arrangement. And I don't want to make go format sound out to be, you know, like too life-changing and wonderful, but it, it was. And then, yeah, I think that's that's really important. It's like, it's not just the same programming language, it's actually the same 
the the same. I mean, I'll say, I think it was like industry shifting because there was like a mm. before GoFump time when basically no programming language was shipped with a format. Or you could go find them, right? You could go find, and there's like many different types and many different kinds. But I feel like most languages that have come out after Go, like every one of them has some sort of FUMP tool that will format the code in this very specific way that is regular for everybody. That like no one as, as the saying goes, no one loves Go formats format, but everybody loves Go font, right? Like no one likes everything about how it's laid out, but everybody's happy that we have it. And I think most other languages now come with that built in. So I think the industry did shift after that. Yeah, a lot of them are also configurable still. And that sort of defeats the object of it. Like, you, yeah, you might, might be able to choose all your formatting things. But the fact that sometimes I've done this and it's really eerie, I'll look at an open source project and I'll look at the code and I feel like I've written that code. That's how familiar it looks. Yeah. And there are still ways in Go to write code differently and do things differently. But more than any language I've ever seen, it I've had that strange experience of like, oh yeah, I, I think I wrote this. Like, And that that's kind of like quite unusual. Yeah, I feel like it's Go is an easy language just kind of move into that area. Because I remember uh, I had interns at our previous job and by the end of the summer, they were writing code that I was like, oh, this looks exactly like code I would have written. I remember that being like, hey, such a proud moment for me. So I was like, oh, I've actually like taught someone how to write code in this like way that is is elegant. But also it's just like, wow, like this is a language where you can just like do that, where you can have these signatures. And it's just like, well, what is this signature? What is it? And I think to some degree, uh, one of the reasons, at least like the code that I've written, I like a lot of Go code is that it's very Go like. And I think because of that formatting, you can tell when Go code is not Go code, when it's like the Java Go or the C++ Go or the, you know, what it's like, oh, you're using the same patterns from your other programming language. You've just imported it into Go. Impl. Yeah, I feel like uh, yeah, Impl, Factory, all those wonderful things. I feel like part of the reason we can actually just identify that so easily is because of Go font. All right. So I think we've talked a bit about, you know, how do we find tools? There's one other topic I wanted to get to before we get into some actual tools, although we have been talking about plenty of uh, actual tools here. When do you decide that you want to write a tool yourself? Not necessarily for other people's consumption, but you're like, this is the thing I've been doing over and over and over. I'm just going to write this. And I guess, is there a point at which you kind of search for a tool and can't find one? Or is it just like, I can just write this quickly myself? Like, you know, does, does anybody here have a view on this? Do you, do you find yourself doing this? Too much. <laughs> I have my, my frustration tolerance is very low. I think it varies so much, though, because like I've definitely seen cases where I wrote a tool. I definitely hadn't done the task enough to justify writing a tool. But it was one of those things where writing the tool felt like enjoyable to me. And I'm like, this looks like a fun project to me. And... It wasn't going to interfere with the rest of my work. So I was like, I'm going to go ahead and do that. So like there, there are exceptions there where it's really not, you, know, you spent more time writing the tool than actually just doing the job. And that's fine if it's like, okay, I'm doing it to learn something or because I enjoyed it or whatever. But then outside of that, I, I think actually evaluating, am I doing this enough to justify the, the cost of a tool is very hard to get right, <laughs> at least for me. Because there are some times where I'm like, okay, I've done this a lot. I definitely need a tool. And then I write the tool and I'm like, for some reason, I'm not doing that anymore. Like what, like, and it's not just because of the tool, it's like, for some reason, I'm just not using that as much. Yeah. Well, there's a, you know, old XKC CD about that, right? Like the equation that you can run based off of how much time it saves you and how often you do it. I've written so many tools and so few of who, like which I've ever even released. Just recently, I found myself having to do like this kind of complicated thing with like Pulsar where... You know, I had to migrate like these things that are called Pulsar functions. And so they're kind of like lambdas and you have to deploy them with a configuration that's also JSON. But like for some reason, when going into Kubernetes, like the JSON could have like sometimes new lines would appear and it would break things. So I was like, OK, well, it's got to be base 64. This really sucks. And so I, I wanted something that would like do like a pipeline of different, you know, things together. And I've wrote this little thing called like, I just call it OmniTool. And it's like a, just a series of like little connected modules. It's like, okay, go to Mongo and do this query. Now take everything and jam it in, you know, through this. And everything assumes that it's like, you know, key value, either key value, text or binary. And then it just kind of, and I'm like, maybe this will be the one where I just use it more often. Right. And so that's kind of the most recent thing where I just needed a tool and it, I couldn't, I couldn't even search for it. It's like, you know, command line, modular, put stuff together, call API. Like there's just Google results are terrible, right? 
So did you try asking ChatGPT? No, I didn't. Uh, I should have actually. But John, I like what you said about you might do it to learn something. And this is always advice I give to anyone that asks like, you know, they want to learn Go, what's the best way to do that? And it's always like solve a problem you have. And I think even if there is a tool for that thing, it's still a great exercise to do that work yourself, solve that problem. You probably, maybe you end up abandoning it because you realize it's too hard, like all the edge cases, getting that right. But even things like CD and like list out the directory and uh, LS, you know, these commands, like even implementing those commands in Go is quite a nice way of learning the language, especially having a specific problem that you need to solve is a really nice way of focusing your learning. And I think building little tools, even if there is a tool, like the JQ tool is really cool. The JSON kind of command line parsing tool, I think is is very good. But that's also very fun to write things like that in Go yourself. So I recommend it for just for the learning and just for the fun of it. I think that is valid. Well, here's a good question then. Like, where do you, where do you decide, like, this is something I kind of struggle with. How do you, where do you decide what, where the line is between, should I write a shell script for this? Or is it time for like a, like a CLI tool, you know, even if it's only got a couple of arguments? Well, for me, it's easy because I don't really, I'm not very good at bash. I'm not very good at just those kind of scripting things. Well, I'm better at it now. ChatGPT exists, but, <laughs> but I, I will go to go to do it just because that's the, that I'm just, it, it's so familiar to me now and it's so easy for me to solve those problems. So I probably opt more for go than I should. I'm a similar boat to Matt where if it's getting any sort of complexity, it's, I'm pretty much immediately out of bash. Cause I just, mm-hmm. I struggle. It, I feel like I've never sat down to learn bash correctly. So I've just sort of like hacked my way to certain things. And whenever I try to sit down to do it, it's like, it's going to be quicker for me just to write this and go than to actually go sit down and learn bash. Yeah. I think there's a kind of abstract idea here around like innovation tokens around like, what are you willing to spend on the thing? Like if you understand the problem very well, you know exactly what it needs to do. Like, okay, even, even that's a complex tool you want to build, but you understand exactly what it is you want to do and you have the time, it's like, go write it in something you're unfamiliar with because you already know what it is you want to do so you know if it's working correctly and you can spend time kind of stumbling over the language or whatever. But if it's an area where you aren't quite sure how this should fit together, what the UX should be and all of that, then you should use something you're much more familiar with because then you won't be stumbling over the language as you're trying to figure out how the thing works. And I think that means that like it really depends on what you're familiar with. Like I don't think there's a universal answer for... Or even like a widely acceptable answer for should this be a bash script or should this be something I write in a programming language I know. I think that highly depends on are you good at bash? Because if you're really good at bash and you understand it really well, you can actually put things together well, then yeah, if you're doing that kind of exploratory, I know I need this tool, but I'm not quite sure how it works, then you'll be able to do it easily in bash. But if you don't understand bash and you also don't have a good concept of what this tool is going to do, you're going to run yourself into some large problems. And this is going to be very frustrating overall. Yeah, I do think there's room for something that's kind of like a sweet middle ground. Like, I'm sure there's libraries like this and I'm sure I've seen them before, but like, there's just so much that like the shell kind of gives you already in terms of like, I want this list of things that are, I know that they're all in the same place. Right. And like, there's this standard interface to like run and or open them. That is like one line. Right. Right. And you know, go, I definitely, I like all of you, I mean, spoiler alert, that was kind of a devil's almost like a devil's advocate question. Like I, I typically reach for go first as well, but like one of the, there have been a few times where, and recently, especially because I've wanted to do stuff with prompting more where I give people options mm. where it's like, then the, the barrier to entry is a little bit higher. Thanks to certain tools, which we'll talk about later. I can more easily kind of like give somebody a list of things on the shell than I can like spin up like a, a terminal UI or whatever in go. And I think there's room for like, kind of like libraries that bridge that scripting language gap, I guess, between say Python or Bash and Go, where you can just be like, okay, well, you know, this library is not exactly the most efficient, but it has this kind of convention of returning like things as lists of things. And like, I I get a file, I get, I get this and that. I think there, there is some room for like something in that space too, because I, I do find even like getting like a list of files and filtering them can be, you know, a bit, tedious and go sometimes. 
So I was going to ask one more question related to deciding to build a tool. Do any of you guys consider the cost of learning a new tool that exists versus like just building something if your needs are relatively simple? Yeah, that, that, that's the other thing about when you're writing your own, when you just write it yourself in Go, you, you really can just focus on solving that one problem. And, you know, the fact that we have Go Run, so you can just say Go Run this Go file, in a way treats it like a, like a scripting language. I like the fact it's very focused. You know exactly what it's doing. You can see, you know, and because Go is very readable, they are actually very easy to share as well. And others can see it and tweak it or whatever themselves. It's very clear. I just find, honestly, Bash, like there's a lot of magic in there. It's like, oh, how do you do this in Bash? Oh, just put an ampersand greater than two and a colon. And it's like, no, I'm not going to put those things in. Thank you, Bash. (laughs) That doesn't make sense. I'm not going to do it. I'll use Go. I feel like for some tools, there's also the problem of the tool does like 30% of what I need and like 110% of what I don't need. Right. And I think sometimes <laughs> yeah. that's also a sign that's just like, even though it, it might technically do even like 90% of what you need, all of the stuff you don't need is going to distract you. So in that case, it might also just be better to write the thing yourself instead of taking what already exists. Yeah, it's that generalization that creeps in. Like, you know, because it happens to all of us, right? You're like, this is a good tool. I'm going to release this. But it should be able to do this, really, right? And like the more that like the generalization creeps in there, the like more difficult it is to learn, right? So I think that's something people who contribute to projects but don't maintain projects don't quite understand when they they're like, here's a PR, you should accept it because it's already written, it's already tested. But like as a maintainer, you have to push back and be like, this is something that not only do I have to maintain going forward, but provides that like mental barrier for somebody who's trying to learn the tool. They have to like now learn all these extra things, or at least be aware of them in some cases. Yeah. If you can do that in user land, if you can do that thing outside of the tool, then that's how you should do it. Like it makes your tool more focused and I think more composable. And like you say, simpler, less to learn, uh, less, to, you know, fewer arguments that, so it, it's easier to use. I mean, it honestly is so important and, I don't know why, but this tends to be a constant thing. Like, I feel like whatever's got, I don't know what's going on in universities, but like, I feel like everybody has this sort of mindset of, well, you could make the tool. It's quite easy to make the tool do these extra things. It makes it more powerful. You just add these arguments and that's therefore a good thing. And you end up almost like, I don't know, like you, you're right. You have to push back against that, but it's, it's a tough pushback because you're really saying like, oh yeah, those things that they're not bad ideas. It's not that it's just, it doesn't need to do this. You can solve this in other ways. And it's, a, it's quite a hard conversation to have. I think. I think there's a lot of cases like that where until you've experienced it, it's really hard to relate to it and understand the complications. Like another example of this is you'll see people say like, Instead of selling that product for $100, why don't you sell it for $10 and sell it to 10 times as many people? And in theory, that sounds great. But like in practice, you have to support 10 times as many people. And that is a lot more work. So like until you've done that, you don't realize like, oh, that is a big cost that you weren't really considering. And it's potentially going to make it much harder at that point. Why don't you sell it for $1,000 and to a tenth of the people? Much easier. (laughs) I mean, the, the hard part about any business is finding that balance. Like... What is the right balance of like the price point that we can support the way we want to support it? And it's not so astronomically high that we can't make sales or anything. And every business tries with different things, but I think it's about finding that right level. And I think like Google is one of the ones that historically has been like, oh, we give everything away for free and make our money with other stuff. So I think people got used to that. But then now we see all these products they make that just get shut down. And it's like, well, clearly there is a downside to this approach. Yeah. I mean, there's really, I guess I was just thinking about this while you're talking about it. And I, it doesn't seem like there really, there really is no one like right answer. It's, you know, eventually things can become so generalized that they become bloated and that there's now like this huge barrier to entry or, or whatever and making things that are smaller and, and to, you know, 10 times as many people, like you say, it's it, now you have 10 times as many people to support, but not only that, but like, well then, you know, you, you maybe you can't use it for half of the things that you need to use it for. And so there's all, there's like always, it's like this moving target of like whether or not a tool is like good enough and there's no perfect, but we always want, there's always somebody who's like, all right, I I figured out the problem with that tool and it's the way we were thinking about it and arranging it. And then they got a a better way and then it kind of works, but yeah, it's really about just constantly experimenting, I guess. I think 
like one of the tools we've all probably used is a caddy server and like seeing how they've evolved over time. There is a, like, there's a way to do very complex like setups for it, but there's also a way to go back to like kind of the original, I just want a really simple caddy file that has like four lines of text on it or something. And I think they've done a good job of managing that. Like you can still use it the simple way, but if you really want the complex stuff, we have found a way to support that as well. And like, they've done a good job of it, but I think for a lot of tools, it's really hard to like have that balance of like, we can support both. I feel like that's a good transition point for uh, perhaps moving into tools and IDEs. And I'll, I'll say like one of the maintainers of NeoVim, TJ DeVries, has this new concept. You know, we have the IDE that everybody's used to, you know, like IntelliJ, Goland, and then you have like your editors, which is like Vim plain or like Notepad or whatever. And he kind of created this new category in the middle called like the personal development environment, which is all about this idea of like you take, you know, kind of the the simple editor and then you start adding pieces to it or you make an editor that has a good enough base to it that you can add the pieces that you need to configure it for basically exactly what you need. And it's this idea of like, okay, well, you, you build a platform, then you build things on top of it instead of trying to build one big thing that does everything for everyone which I think is like some of the angst people have around IDEs is it's like, yeah, there's this huge learning curve and sometimes this huge startup curve to like, I got to wait five minutes for this thing to boot, like in the battle days of Eclipse based IDEs. And I think that that's an interesting like area. And I think things like NeoVim and uh, VS Code fit very well into that space. And kind of like what you were talking about, John, with the, you know, caddy server example, where it's like, yeah, you can have a super simple config and it just it works fine. It'll do everything you need. Or you can do all of the complex stuff you want to need, want to do. And it has this nice, it has the ability to span that whole thing. And that's likely because of, you know, building it more as a platform instead of just as a single thing that you're shipping so other people can contribute to it. So with that, I think we've, we've talked a bit about editors already. Uh, does anybody have any other things they want to say about editors before we move on to other tools? I mean, I will say, I think NeoVim has come a long way, but they still have... I think a long way to go. I was recently using LazyVim, not the plugin manager, but like the, the, you know, the quote unquote distribution. And it's a pretty good start, but like, I still think like, even though Lua is better, I think what NeoVim is really missing is like that killer kind of configuration experience. It still seems kind of like all over the place, but like that concept of the PDE, I, I think is like really game changing. And I'm, I'm looking forward to see where that goes. Yeah, I still think NeoVim is probably not like the first editor you want to jump in. I think VSCO <laughs> is probably a good first place to start. But I do think it, it's like there's a nice thing about being able to be in the terminal all the time and what that gives you versus having to like jump between, you know, a terminal emulator and your editor. And I know that like, you know, some of some editors, both NeoVim and uh, VS Code have built in terminals, but I think that's like kind of inverting the thing. Like I want my editor in my terminal, not my terminal in my editor. I think there's also like another way that like, at least the way I approach that problem is I make sure I use a terminal that has a global hotkey to like bring it <laughs> onto my screen. So like, cause I actually can't stand the VS Code like terminal that's in there, but I, I do agree with you that I need a quick way to get to my terminal all the time. So having a global hotkey that works everywhere is very handy. That's a good tip. You know, the Goland, the JetBrains IDE, I, I haven't actually used it. And I'm kind of like, at some point, I'm going to try it. But I still remember when it was called Gogland. Gogland. <laughs> Gogland. What was it? Gogland or Gogland? I don't know. Gogland. It was G-O-G-L-A-N-D. They just dropped a Go-Gland. G when they turned it to Goland. So. Yeah. What were they thinking with that? I think Gogland is the name of an island or something like that. No. Yeah. Oh, I see. So it's not Go. I say, if anybody listening is new to Go and they want to try something, Goland is definitely something worth checking out. It's a great like VS Code and, and Goland are probably the two easiest entry points to go. You pay for you pay for Gogland. I mean Goland, don't you? Mm-hmm. I think there's certain free tiers you can get, but I don't remember why. Or I don't know if it's like students or which ones there are. I think they do have some like ways to approach it that aren't too too expensive. And then there is a trial or two, I think. But VS Code is completely free. All right. I think we've talked about editors enough. I know, Andy, you had some some tools that you were alluding to that you wanted to bring up. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty recent, but like, I'll be honest, like, like this is that charm bracelet stuff, like, or is it, are they just charm? Does anybody know? I think it's just charm. I think it's just charm. The, the GitHub username is charm bracelet, right? Yeah. Okay. 
Oh, well then maybe they changed it. I don't no, know. it's probably just charm. And I'm just, that's, I just spent so much time staring at their GitHub that I, that's all I remember. But um, they have a tool that's called gum. And at first I didn't really get it. Um, but basically what gum is, is it's like this combination of the various different, like kind of interaction, some of the various different interaction widgets of bubble tea with into what, a single go binary. That's all done through environment variables and, and command line flags. And so like you can use it to make interactive shell scripts very, very easily. So like you, for example, can, you know, be like such and such equals. And, and, and even if you don't know bash really well, you, you probably know that, you know, back ticks or like dollar parentheses, like interpolates that command. Right. And so it's very easy to say, you know, user once equals and then a gum command that like prompts them with like a list or whatever, and it can filter and page and all that stuff. And it's re it's actually really, really, really nice because it's, it does just enough. I find most of the time, the only thing maybe it can't do is input validation, but like, I really love it. And they also have another one called VHS, which like can kind of record a terminal session and render it as like a movie or a graphic. It's very useful for sharing, you know, issues or how to's and stuff like that. I, I like their stuff a lot. I enjoy their naming so much. Yeah. <laughs> it's very cute. And that's like their, their, I mean, their GitHub repos are just on point. Like, yeah, their branding is. Yeah. I do wonder if they've, if they have like, designers involved they must do their website is kind of great like they, so yeah and i think more tools should be like this it's sometimes i think people dismiss it like this is just putting lipstick on the pig and you want to focus on the pig but you know to stick with this analogy you're going to prefer a pig if it's got lipstick on than not no i'll drop the analogy that's well i mean their their whole styling their styling tool library is called lip gloss but i think i think yeah. in this case <laughs> gum really like so like i mean say what you will like certainly using bubble tea is is definitely a type of frameworky kool-aid like they're they're kind of broader library but this takes a lot of that design and kind of utility and just puts it in one single little binary, right? And you can just drop that anywhere and then you can have interactive shell scripts to your heart's content. And it, to me, that actually sped up, you know, it's actually sped up, cause I, I had a, I, you know, wanted to write a script recently to like spin up a new infrastructure or something or other, right? And I didn't, you know, I was just like, I need to get this done. I don't, you know, want to do another CLI. And like, it was so easy for me to just like grab a bunch of variables, a couple of if statements, and then put like an interaction layer on it and call it a day with that tool. It was, it's really useful. So do you think the tools we use shape our design type choices, like going the other way? I say this as somebody who coming from like the Ruby background and then also seeing Python developers, I felt like there was always a very clear divide as to like Ruby developers seem to be more design focused, like, or they thought more about it. Whereas the Python application, maybe this isn't true now, but at the time it felt like the Python ones were just get the data out there and it doesn't have to look as pretty. Yeah, I do think there's something in that. Like one of the reasons to not have all these extra tools loaded into say VS Code, if you're building, if you're writing libraries and you're writing packages for other people to use, you sort of want to have the same experience that they're having. And so like we have autocomplete in our IDEs. And in, I used to do C sharp and you would end up with very long method names and class names and things because it didn't matter because the IDE would basically autofill it. So it's like, have, if you're building tools for other people to use, you kind of want to be in a similar situation as they are as possible, because that's, that'll give you the best chance of, of getting that tool right. And I think being similar to other tools that are also in that ecosystem pays dividends as well. And it may be that, well, I can think of some better flags here that make more sense in this case. But actually, if there are any flags that everyone's using that use particular letters or whatever, or they have particular names for those things, it's probably worth sticking with them just for the inertia of that, uh, the bringing people's current experience along with you. But I think as long as people are thinking about the experience of the tools that they're building, I think that's that really matters like it's really important and i've seen tools succeed be just because they had a better user experience and fewer features even but the experience is better and that's why i'm quite excited about the the charm.sh tool set i think that that would i would use that next time i build a tool yeah it's yeah it saved me a lot of time mm. 
And I, I, th- I think you're right about, I, th- I think you're right about Ruby. I always wondered why that was, but yeah, it definitely seems like it has, they were always like kind of more design focused. Uh, tell me if I'm misremembering this right. Did Ruby used to like have like a little, I feel like I remember seeing like red text that said Ruby in some tool or another, like that was bundled. Ruby on Rails was the web framework. Okay. Yeah. Which had red. I don't know if that's what you're referring to. No, but I just remember, yeah, I even back early in the days using like Sinatra versus say like a, 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 a Perl framework, it just felt like, I don't know, like there was a nicer look to it. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of part of the whole web 2.0 movement where people started to realize actually our tools can look good, even if we're their dev tools, <laughs> even if they're for geeks, you know, they, they are, they can still look good and should. Well, and there's a, there's a whole aesthetic you can appeal to there too, right? That's just different. You know, I've definitely noticed that like devs tend to like things, you know, like a little more pic, like pixel perfect and like angular in some cases, you know, certain colors are more popular and you can kind of appeal to a certain, I don't know, feel that way. And dark mode for all of the things. Yeah, like so I see some people with like their their IDE or their editor in light mode, and I'm like, what is? <laughs> like I've never seen it like this. My God. The one case I've heard is that if you're presenting, it's a lot better to have a light mode. Yeah. Like if you're presenting with a projector, so like that one makes sense. But a lot of people who have given me that also switch to a dark mode when they're doing other stuff. So I'm like, okay, they're switching. Yeah. Then there's the people who just prefer light mode, and I'm like, I don't relate, but okay. Unpopular opinion: light mode is terrible. <laughs> The time I use light mode is if I'm outside and it's light mm. already, you know, like because of natural, like the sun or something, you know, then light mode stands out more. But my, my editor is white, but like black text on a white background. But oddly enough, I cannot use a terminal that way. I can't do it. Like it's got to <laughs> be dark mode terminal. <laughs> Like I, <laughs> I tried it. I've tried making the same theme in my terminal and I'm just like, ew. And I just stop and I don't know why. <laughs> How often do you change them? Do you tend to have one style that you always use or do you go through and yeah, like, I fancy a change now I'm going to switch it up a bit. I'm very monogamous, but not that monogamous, right? Like, so I'll switch it up periodically. I mean, I, oddly enough, I've been using the same monochrome like editor theme that I made for like over like two years now almost. And I just keep using it. I don't know why. I guess it, I like it. But um, for Terminal, no, I'm always just like, what's what's better than Solarize right now? What's the new thing? Like, I'm always looking for the new font. That's that's my obsession. Yeah. You know? It's fun. I'm like, what's better on my eyes? Like, my eyes hurt. It's my font, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like everybody does this, though. Like, when I was a kid, I'd go to my grandpa- grandparents' house And my grandmother would rearrange the furniture in the living room like every month. And I don't know why, but like it was just something that they like to do. Right. So everybody has their thing. It's like moving house. You get to move house. But always dark mode though. (laughs) Always dark mode. I do stick with that. (laughs) In the terminal. What, for the sofa? For your sofa? Yeah. 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 Actually, yes. Yes. Wow. Mm. So so speaking of uh, terminals, terminal emulators. Well, how how do you all feel? Is everybody here just an iTerm2 kind of person or... Are you using some of the new fancier terminal emulators? I love iTerm2, and yet, like, I keep... So there's this guy that I work with, and he, you know, in the Go channel at work, and he was posting recently about his, like, NeoVim setup, and I was it just, like, caught me in the right moment. And I'm like, you know, I should give that a try, right? And then he's like, here's my dot files. And I'm like, what's WesTerm, right? And so I start to, like, look into, like... Because I was aware of other... But, like, Kitty, I used Kitty for a little bit. But I think the big thing for me, the only thing that keeps me like trapped in iTerm land is the inability for me to remap command to control in anything else. Cause like my, I just, I can't do that pinky thing. Right. And there's only the one control key on the MacBook. <laughs> but like I've, I've played around with West term and it's pretty friggin' cool. What is it? It's just a really fast terminal emulator. That's got like, I don't know good key binding support apparently and yeah, yeah it does it does like stuff like gpu rendering so if you do use ligatures it's like it, it renders them very nicely and things like that it's wes wez yes for if you're in the uk or if you speak british english the other one that i've seen pop up is um have any of you used warp i keep meaning to it wasn't that like that one kind of blurs the lines a little bit though doesn't it? it's got like some interesting 
menu. Yeah, it's got, it's got some different stuff there. It's got like multi, like almost like multi select or multi cursor type things, like you'll see in VS Code. It has oh, stuff for that. So cool. It's one of those things where if somebody's new, I'm like, yeah, you should try Warp. I've been using iTerm so long that it's like, I I probably could switch. I just haven't taken the effort to do it. I'm like, I need some time where I'm not focused on <laughs> getting work done and I can actually like mess around with something new. But I've had it on my computer, like, and I mess around with it. I'm like, I really should use this more. Yeah, it's like me and Wes term. Yeah. And I mentioned this earlier, but if you are using some one of these, most of them have like ways to do global hotkeys, and I highly recommend checking that out. Mm-hmm. Like iTerm especially. Warp looks so cool, but I don't like that in their marketing page. Of like powered with AI. Just <laughs> <laughs> they have something where like I forget what it is. It's it's in my opinion the AI stuff. At least the last time I messed around with it wasn't that great. But I think the idea is to like, if you want to like, how do I undo this commit? It's a way of like sort of asking that question and it's saying, oh, here's the git command to do that. That's very, that's okay. That's a perfect, that brings up a perfect intersection of my, my promise not to use bad language, but a tool that requires that I must. So it's, has anybody, uh, it's, I, I think it's just called, and I'm sorry, I like, oh, but it has the word, it's the, oh, the, yeah. And, and it's like, it's an, it's an absurd name. But basically, it's it's like you just type <laughs> if you've messed up a command, and it'll look through your history, and, and it'll it'll like use like rules to pick what it should have been, uh. and then just it'll be like, "Did you mean this?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I did." And then it just goes like, "It's it's great." I've been using that a little bit recently. Wow! Like one of the examples is you type like apt and forget the dash for get apt get. Yeah. And like Roger, type your command, it'll look at that and say, "Oh, did you mean apt dash get?" And like have your command, and if you just hit, I think you just hit like yes or something, and it like automatically types that in. Then wait, does it undo the mistake as well? It, yeah, basically you you type in, and then essentially it'll show you what it thinks the command should have been. Yeah. And if you say yes, that's what I wanted, it'll type and run the command at that point. And it will. I think it also yeah edits your history as well in some certain cases. Well, speaking of editing, I can't wait to see how the editors <laughs> deal with this. We talked about we don't it's like. It's just so. I mean, in our defense, we didn't name the tool. It's just so useful. <laughs> Well, and it's like, I mean, that's what you want to type, right? And so they just overload what you want to type. <laughs> there you go. So the, again, back into that nature, our our nature. Oh, Amazing. Uh, it's going to be interesting in the show notes as well. I don't... <laughs> oh, I know. How are you even going to cite that? Yeah. Oh, man. If I'll say this. If you're in school, like high school, middle school, don't install that one. Mm. Don't get yourself in trouble. <laughs> we need to like just make an alias that's like, the heck? Mm. <laughs> or something like that. Oh, heck. Type fudge or something. Jeez. <laughs> that sounds so American to me. Oh, heck. Oh, shucks. Yeah, shucks. They're nice. Uh, okay, so, so we got a couple more categories before we go into our unpopular opinions. Build process tools. Anybody oh. uh, just plain old go? Anybody using make? Anybody using one of those font? Was it basil or pants or... Any of those? Basil scares me a little bit. That's the, that's the go just abandon everything and we'll just take care of it tool, right? Or like, but there's, um, I find myself honestly using task files a little bit recently just to kind of fill in that gap for repeatable stuff that I would otherwise use like a make file for, which mostly has amounted recently to like combining building with like logging into like, Elastic container service or something like that, right? There's always that stupid command that you have to do. And it's like, I don't want to remember to periodically reissue it. So I'll just put it in the make file, right? So make deploy will always just do that, right? And so I'll use task files for stuff like that now, but. Yeah. I quite like make files. They tell a story, the storytelling opportunity in a repo as well, because there are common commands that you need to do. And it's a nice way to communicate to other people. I don't get what that whole phony thing is that you do. I still don't know why we do that. They're like, oh, yeah, sometimes you have to write, oh, pho- this is phony. Oh, you only have to do that if there could be a file with that same name. That's basically the only reason. Yeah. yeah. Forget it. I'm not doing that. Have any of you used um, <laughs> Mage, M A G E? Yes, I've used it pretty extensively. How do you like it? It's okay. Honestly, like, there's, you know what Mage does is Mage does this thing that was kind of like what I was talking about earlier with that, like, bridging the. Um, the shell gap a little bit, you know, so they've got like commands that are supposed to like their target based commands that are supposed to be like, do this if this is newer than this. Right. Uh, yeah. But it's just not quite DSL enough in certain ways for it to like, I found myself doing a little too, I guess, much with it. 
but it's good. It's it, it is it is better experience than than make for most things. But they because they go it's like go they go programs, aren't they? It's basically a go school, yeah go program that you run. It's it's nice for somebody who like doesn't know Bash or is like new to programming. I think a mage file is a little bit easier to to start with because if they're already learning Go, it's like this is going to be similar. But it's I've definitely had cases where like I had mage files for an old project and for some reason they weren't working the way I wanted them to and. I feel like I have that less often with like make files. Yeah. Uh, do you know, like this is something we have as well in the exec command stuff in Go, putting every argument as its own thing and like, having the command as a separate thing just feels so unnatural. I know that's what's happening, but I, d- I kind of want that. I want to be able to just have it as a string and have it parse it really. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. And Docker has that too with, um, what is it? the command or whatever yeah you put in uh, like an array of arguments don't you it's like a square bracket and you there's a surprising number of dragons there though as i have like kind of learned recently you you need a shell like you need a shell parser and then it's like which shell parser and do you support backticks and piping and and stuff like that but i will say that literally every time like i do anything with like running a program and go i rewrite like exec command to just take a a flat variatic yeah and then split it up because i'm just i'm not (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Oh, speaking of uh, shell parses and formatters, a nice little, if you are going to write shell scripts, a nice little tool from uh, Daniel Marty. It's just called SH, but it has like an SH font and it's like a shell parser and interpreter and all of this, which is like a nice little quality of life thing for if you're writing shell scripts. In Go or... Oh, uh, no, no. If you're just writing like regular old batch scripts, it's just like a tool that you run that will do like, so it has like sh fumped, right? Which will just format your shell script for you in the same way gomfump does. Oh, um, nice. And yeah, it has a built in interpreter and parser and all of that. So you can do like more interesting things. Yeah. That's MV Dan on GitHub. He does great work. We have, we've yeah. had him on GoTime a few times, so we should get him back soon. He's one of the major tools contributors. There's like a whole tools working group within Go, and he's a, he's a member of that. I thought you were saying he's a major tool. No. I, saying, I thought, that's not fair. He's nice. He's definitely nice. He's, he's a really nice guy. Good, he's a good man. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> just throws Matt under the bus. <laughs> he's not coming back, is he? <laughs> Lightning round of the last few tools, uh, tool categories. Documentation tools. I know I use Dash. Does anybody use uh, something similar, something different? Do you just go, you know, Package that go to the- Oh, Dash for sure. I only use Dash when I'm traveling and my internet's not going to be great. Otherwise, I'm just on Google almost always. I guess the other thing I do is, do you guys ever just use like your editor to just jump to the code? That's another thing I yeah. do a lot. Most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. If that's not available, then I would just go to Google. But yeah, that's one of the great things about Go. The fact that the standard library is open source is you can just nip in and poke around. Yeah. Like... I find myself all the time just like if I want to see the docs for a function, just writing in my code so I can jump to the definition. Yeah. <laughs> and like sometimes that's faster than opening up any other tool is just writing the code and jumping to it. Oh, I feel so much better about my life now. <laughs> I was doing that the other night and I'm like, oh, God, if anybody saw me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, with autocomplete and everything, it's so quick to do. Yeah, but Andy, just because John does something, no, I, don't, I, don't, I, wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't over index on that. <laughs> that said, Visual Studio Code is actually like, I feel like I'm too old. You know, sometimes like, like I see other people like using the, you know, what do you call the shoot? I don't even know what it's called. The bar at the top, but whatever. It's the multifunction bar. Command palette. Yes, that's it. And like, you can just say, you know, I just learned that you can type um, colon in there and do the standard Vim jump to line thing. Right. And so it's just like, you know, you can jump to code using that too, instead of having to type it out. I don't do that, but like you can. Yeah. I use that one. Definitely. To go to a specific line. It's so nice. Yeah. It's like one of those things where I keep telling myself, like you were saying, you need to, I just need to come back and like spend some time with this one tool. I don't know though. Yeah. There's a bunch of little things in VS Code like that with like, I think it's like Command R will let you, at least with my key bindings, I assume they're not changed, but uh, you can like jump to like specific methods or functions that way. So like when you're talking about how do you move around without using your mouse and keyboard, sometimes it's just you, you know, knowing those commands to jump to the function you want. Okay. Three more categories, real quick. Terminal multiplexer. Anybody use one? Tmux? Imagine nobody's using screen anymore, but maybe there's some old holdouts. There's that new one too, isn't there? That's like supposed to be like Tmux, but oh, it has this wacky name. I'll have to look it up later, maybe put it in the show notes. But it's there's like a new up-and-coming terminal multiplexer as well. What's a terminal multiplexer? 
I mean, so, you know, basically um, it's like Tmux and Screen. They kind of arose out of the need to have multiple, be able to address multiple terminals without over like potentially a low latency connection, right? Mm. Or keep things resident. It's like tabs. Yeah, more or less, but you can also split, copy. They do they do tons of really amazing stuff. Yeah, so I'm a big Tmux guy. I actually have, I actually have some code in Tmux. Oh, yeah. Very proud of that. Also, a very nice, useful thing of I'm not going to use it then. <laughs> a nice thing of Tmux is that it like keeps your tabs, it keeps your terminal alive even if your actual terminal emulator like crashes or whatever, which can be very nice, especially when you're on a server and you want to like run something for a very long time. You can just pop it in there and it's good to go. All right, two more application launchers. I'm a big Alfred user. I know there's Raycast, which is new, which I have not looked at. But does any do you guys use you know application launchers or anything like that? That's like Spotlight. Yeah, yeah it's Spotlight like Spotlight on the Mac. Yeah, it's like Spotlight. Oh, yeah. I just use that. I use Spotlight. It's really annoying. I've noticed on my phone, I'll search for an app sometimes, and it has like Siri is deciding what to show. And if I've got an app with that exact name, it doesn't come up at the top. So it'll show me like other things it wants me to see based on that search. And it's like, you know, if I've got an app called egg and i type in egg into that search i want that app at the top that's probably what i'm after i don't have an app called egg see alfred would help you i guess yeah alfred is one of those things where you can customize a little bit more of it it has some other stuff built in too like um if you pay for it you can get like the text snippets that expand mm, like yeah. the same type thing that like text expander does so if you find yourself writing similar like sentences or whatever quite frequently it can be very helpful for certain stuff yeah but you just have to you do have to learn it it's an investment you've got a like learn these tools because I did have Alfred installed for a while and I just used it to just find apps and it was too much. I mean, that's a good starting point. It, it, there's also some things with it that can be handy. Like um, I forget what it was. I don't think it's math because I think spotlight will do math for you, mm -hmm. but there's different things like that where sometimes it's just really handy to like give you the answer directly in yeah. the little pop-up. I've, I've written a few little tiny plugins to do things like converting between like binary or binary and decimal or hexadecimal and decimal Stuff like that, which is just like, I hate Googling for that because there's not a Google calculator that just does it. I mean, FZF has been like the biggest game changer for my life. Any, like any terminal in integration with Fuzzy Finder, that plus like a couple of like smart selectors have just like changed my life forever. Like there's, I think it's like Tmux fingers or whatever, where it's just like, you can, you can just enter a mode where it's like, okay, anything that looks like it's important. So like a UUID or like a executable or like a number or something. And then it'll just highlight those like that. That kind of thing has been a tremendous difference for me. Oh, yeah. SDF is, is awesome. OK, last category, non-development tools. So Notion, Obsidian, any of those types of things. More like I guess knowledge base. Any ones you guys love to use? Still looking. My note in Mac is what I use for like sort of planning out big projects like if i'm like designing a course or something big that have a bunch of ideas it can be useful i think obsidian and those do similar stuff but they're like markdown files i feel like i use it one tool to sort of organize it all and then i end up just having markdown files with like here's an outline and then i have all individual files i'll create i use markdown a ton though i really want to be good at those i just can't yet like I, i've tried so many of them all the way from like NV, notational you know nv alt to like I was really looking forward to like the sequel to that that never came out. And like, I forget there's been a, several of them recently. And then for some reason, just sticking with them is really hard. And there's always like this guy on YouTube who's like the guru of how to use that particular software. And he's got his workflow and I'm just so intimidated. But yeah, let me know if anybody finds one that really works for you. Like Obsidian is a, a cool one, but like, and there's a plugin for VS Code that I think gets a lot of what Obsidian does inside of VS Code. It's just like you said, you kind of have to be writing pretty regularly and like actually doing stuff with it often. So like in my experience, if you're trying to like write a book or do something like that, it's a really useful tool to sort of help map out those ideas and start getting going. But if you don't have a big project like that to spend a good bit of time with the tool, it's very hard to learn. Uh, one of what tool I really like, which is kind of like it's really powerful, but really easy to learn is bike. It's like an outliner. And it's like kind of like a little bit better than a regular outliner because you can like move entire sections or chunks of things around just using keyboard shortcuts, which is really nice. Um, it also has like an optimized autocorrect and grammar system. So it just like it corrects as you go, even for very large files, which is one of the things that like text and other things struggle with a lot. 
It also does those nice like little quality of life things where it um, it will like for a link, it'll have like the text of the link. And if you click it, you can edit it and have a little icon to the side to actually go to the link. Because that's always something that's annoying in a text editor when you click it and you're like, I don't want to go to it. I want to edit it like <laughs> or worse. Yeah. When it's like I, this is a link, but it's not a link. Right. Like I click on it and just go to edit it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And bike doesn't bike also have like you can nest things quite well, and then you yes. can like open it just at a, like a deep n- rooted thing. Yeah, that's quite nice because you get the sort of mind node thing. I like mind node too. Like anything where it's really high level and you don't have a really good idea of what it is, just throwing ideas into a mind node type thing. You know, for anyone that hasn't seen it, it's like a it's it's like a tree. You have like something in the middle, and then you can have branches come off and branches off that, and keep going forever. That is a very nice way to um, just to get ideas out of your head, and then gives you it gives you a place to go from. But I do that if I'm writing comedy, actually, if I'm writing jokes, because often jokes are really just about linking things together, and that is a great way to do that. If you think of like I want to make a joke about this thing and this thing, like two things. Just list all the things you can in a mind node about subject A and then forget that and just do all the things in subject B and then you'll see some of those leaf nodes will line up and that's then you, that, you can write a joke that way. So top tip there for anyone aspiring comedians. If you want like something online based, there's one called Workflowy, which I think is very similar to Bike, where you can like dive into individual like subcategories and you can even mark things off if you want. I, it's paid though, so. I notice I have all of these tools installed, by the way. As every what every single one you've just said, I have them all in, and I don't use them all properly. I used to use Workflowy all the time, and then I think their free plan changed to like something that was basically useless, <laughs> and I at the time wasn't using it enough to justify paying for it anymore. <laughs> do you have a blue tick on Twitter, John? So do I have a tick on Twitter? No, I do not. Huh. I think I struggle. I, I have a kind of you know attention deficit thing that's pretty bad, and it, that love that keeps me from using a lot of the like kind of. St- even like some of the semi-structured tools, like, cause I'll get so far and then I'll be like, eh, or it, it looks like too disorganized. And then I just can't like, I'm just like, well, how do I get structure out of this again? So I think I'm still kind of looking for that like sweet spot of just like, and a lot of time I just end up with stickies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, you shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate that when we're talking about tools like pen and paper is a quite a great tool. Like. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a big marker board on my wall that I yeah. use all the time. So like a white race board. So I have, I have one more tool that I think is, I like this tool for multiple reasons. It's called Muse. And one of the reasons I like it is because there's kind of a research lab that's behind it. And they're working with people like Martin Kletman. So if you have read Designing Data Intensive Applications, he's the one that wrote that book, pretty famous book. And they're doing a lot of really cool things with distributed systems and CRDTs. And they're kind of baking that into this app, which is just kind of like endless nested whiteboards basically and it's kind of a, an apple ecosystem only thing so it's like ipads and mac os and that kind of stuff and like really it's like it's kind of really an ipad focused thing ipad plus the apple pencil but it's i found it to be like a fantastic just like really high quality user experience for just kind of like mapping things out or reading things and going from like writing by hand to like typing up notes and all of that it's just like it kind of really is like a digital whiteboard in like that kind of true sense, which is kind of like you put things and you drag things around and all of that. And it's just, it's really cool. And all the tech underneath it is also pretty awesome. Mm. It's cool when you can zoom in yeah. and then you sort of like, you, then you can leave some detail and you don't have to know that in advance. I think stuff like that's really cool. Yeah. And you can like nest boards and they have this really nice like inbox kind of a thing where you can kind of just like shove something over to the side and like zoom out a bunch of levels and then put it somewhere else. So it has all of these really really nice like quality of life workflow things and their user manual is just fantastic it's all like videos and things like that so it's it's quite phenomenal so if any i I encourage people to go check that out this might do it for me there we go i also have a slight attention deficit thing and i've got a banana (laughs) (laughs) all right so uh with that let's get to unpopular opinions So, John, since you might have to dip in a, in a little bit, why don't you go first? 
So I have a question first. I almost want to have a poll. Anybody out there, Matt's eating a banana, so this makes more sense. If you eat a banana and it has those like sort of softer brown spots, how many of you actually eat that versus how many of you like cut them out of the banana? Mm. Well, I just eat all of it. I'm happy completely. I saw you eat it. That's why I was, I know I, I tend to cut them out, but I'd like, I've seen people eat them and I don't think anything of it, but my wife saw somebody do it and was like, that looks disgusting to me. It's the sweetest part. It's actually delicious, but I also eat the entirety of an apple, including the core. Uh, and there's, you know, there's mixed, oh. people have mixed views on that. So you basically oh. just, <laughs> you were sounding very sane and then you added that last If you bit. actually, if you eat it from the end, you won't even notice. <laughs> no. no, don't start in the middle. Well, I mean, like, I mean, I, I should say along the long, what axis of the apple would that be? No, this is a digression. This is bad. <laughs> Which way is up on the apple? No, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to no. do this. I also opened the banana the opposite way to most people because I saw some um, on a wildlife documentary. So, okay. If I open my daughter's banana on the opposite end, she yells at me every time that it's the wrong way, <laughs> even if it's easier to open there. So I'm like forced mm. to not do that. I literally don't think that there's a correct way to, to open a banana, especially since the bananas we eat are just like completely manufactured. Like bananas don't have seeds. You can't like plant a banana in the ground and grow a banana tree. They're like completely human creations, the ones we eat. So I don't think there's a correct How way. How do we make more of them then? They're all grafts. You have to graft it onto another tree to make a banana tree. I think they might all come from near in England where I'm from as well, the uh, in Derbyshire. Can we just talk about one second how that like eating the banana from the opposite end thing is like the most engineer thing ever and is like, in my opinion, and it's like kind of sums up this whole episode, right? Because it's like you read that one time, like I'm always I'm like, it's like, you know, eating it from this way is more efficient because blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I never knew that. Now I can do it the right way. <laughs> and like, I just do that with everything, like <laughs> my tools, yeah. my font. It's yeah. just always, it's like my hobby. You're right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. John, was that your actual unpopular opinion? Okay. <laughs> no, my unpopular opinion, I, I guess the, what I would go with today is that um, I think there's value in using just something like notepad or like a basic text editor with nothing installed um, with programming, at least early on to get sort of, I feel like it just helps you learn to pay attention to certain details and like really focus on what's there. Because I noticed that with a lot of people who are new to programming, they'll miss small little like typos or bugs like that, that an experienced developer like really stands out to them. And I think sometimes it's because they're so used to writing like paragraphs and stuff where your your brain can just kind of skip over it and make sense of it. Whereas like a computer doesn't know how to do that. Mm. Yeah. I think when you're learning, I think that that's, yeah, completely valid. Like depends on what you want to focus on. Right. Sure. And like, I, I say this in the sense of, I don't think most people ever do it, but like, I remember I wrote Java on like an it wasn't Notepad. It was something similar to that on Linux um, that basically had no autocomplete or anything. And Java was awful for it at times, but it definitely helped me understand what was in certain standard libraries and how it worked. And like the tools that I was using for those projects, I really understood well. And I, like, I definitely did some bad habits of like importing an entire, in Java, you could like import like an entire star, like sub package type thing. So I'd import way more than I needed to, but it, it, it was still helpful. It's not like I would recommend doing it all the time, but like doing it every once in a while was a helpful tool. Yeah. I feel like that could be a, I don't know if that's unpopular. Maybe people feel unpopular. I mean, ultimately. Well, I mean, if you take it to the extreme, like I did last time, then yes. Yeah. If I say you should never use an editor with autocomplete, <laughs> or, that would be. <laughs> or if you're just like, eh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was very unpopular. Yeah. We, we will, we will pull it on uh, Twitter and the Fediverse and, and see how it does. Okay. So Andy. You know, I've been thinking about this, and I think I would probably say that for me, at least right now, running NeoVim is a lot like being a Jeep owner, right? It's just kind of like a hobby that you're never really done with, <laughs> right? And it takes you have a, you have a you have a decent amount of time being productive, but you also have like a decent amount of time where you're like fiddling with it and trying to get it right. And um, yeah, it's it, it's as much hobby as it is productivity tool to me right now. So hmm. so. Yeah, you don't. Rec do you recommend people try it? Do you f have fun hacking with it at least? I'm uh, yeah, I've I've had some fun, you know, messing with like kind of what's considered to be modern, you know, NeoVim, but like I have yet to find something that like really like works for me and hasn't doesn't like keep breaking, you know. So I, like I said, I tried lazy NVim and you know it's it's constantly spamming me with notifications that things are updating. 
or that a command won't be installed and it'll fail or like even just deleting lines and I'll get a notification that's there for like just a little bit too long, you know? So finding that right balance, I think, I feel like what NeoVim is really missing is like a good standard, but fully featured configuration that'll work with most languages, like out of the box easily. Mm. I know there have been attempts at that, but yeah, I feel like, I feel like NeoVim is, if you do want to be, tinkering or you really want like a very specific setup like i have over time transformed my setup to be very very particular but i often don't find i don't spend a lot of time messing with things unless i'm like trying to write a new language or trying to do something else so it's like i kind of set it to what i want and then kind of forget about it but i also feel like that's bad i don't like that because then i kind of get stuck with things that are like slightly more efficient i don't try to change things up enough so I'm trying to find a good middle ground there. And I think NeoVim kind of pushes me toward more toward doing that than other editors might. But yeah, I, I can kind of see, I can see that opinion where it's kind of like, it, it's definitely not you're like, I just need a car to get me from point A to point B. It's like, I'm going to be doing, I, I want to maximize my time. I like to go out and do adventuring. I like to be in that type of environment. It's like, you know, I feel like it's like, it's like a Jeep owner versus like a pickup truck owner where it's like you're not using your pickup truck for the things you're going to be using it for but i feel like jeep people that buy jeeps are generally people that do like to go adventuring and stuff like that right and they're always kind of tweaking it and and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with that honestly but like if you're not that kind of person just that's something to think about yeah Yeah. i feel like that about linux yeah yeah linux is one of those things gotta like tweak a lot yeah Okay, well, well, we'll pull that and see how it does. Matt, do you have an mm. unpopular opinion? Indeed, I do. I think tools need to make more of an effort to stay simple and don't try and solve it. We kind of touch, touched on this, but don't get too clever. When they get too clever, there's more. they're more likely to go wrong. And uh, one example is I've noticed Go imports uh, recently. Sometimes I'll use like a package. I'll say like log dot something, and it will automatically import some obscure log package Mm, (laughs) and not the standard library log package, which is the one I'm after. And I don't know, I quite know why it's doing that, but and I'm sure it's my fault, but I wish it was just kind of would just keep it simple. I think anytime you've experienced autocorrect or as I like to call it sometimes auto incorrect, these tools are trying to help, but they just get in the way. Copilot also does this a bit when you, I used Copilot to, to play around sometimes and it's like there's someone there trying to finish your sentences while you're in the middle of a sentence. Mm. And, it's, and it's just like, no, just, no, not that. And it's just like guessing stuff. And it guesses things that aren't even possible. Like, you know, it'll just get, like probably these arguments. It's like, well, no, I mean, you know, this method exists. Those arguments aren't, they don't fit. But they will, that will get better for sure. But like, yeah, I don't know. Generally, when tools go wrong, it's like I'd, I'd rather not have any tools than ones that are getting in the way. I know. So this should stay simple. That's not going to be unpopular, is it? Mm. No way. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe. I mean, like, you know, there's probably at least one or two people out there who's like, oh, I, I want to use GNU Parallel for everything, and that guy won't tell me any different. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but... <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, we'll we'll pull and we'll see. Mm-hmm. So I think I do have an unpopular opinion. This might actually be a recycled one. I might be at the point where I'm like recycling unpopular opinions, but I've been thinking about this lately, and I feel like we have massively over-indexed on making it simple and easy to get into software engineering. Like I feel like we have, as an industry, focused far too much on making it easy to get in and not nearly enough on making it possible to stay in. And I guess what I mean by that is it's like there's all of these nice tools and frameworks and things to get you started with stuff and to make it really fast and make it really simple for you to get on board and if you start being productive. And I, I've heard the argument a lot that it's like, oh, well, this makes it so new people don't give up so that they keep going so they don't kind of get stuck. But I think the cost of that down the road is that people don't know how things work. So you start building a lot of stuff and then people have no idea what's what's going wrong when it breaks and they get stuck and they don't know what to do because they never built up that tolerance or that debugging capability to go figure out, oh, this is how this thing works. So I know that this thing might be wrong here. I can go look here and then fix it in that area. 
And I think that's doing, has done massive harm to us as an industry. So I think it's, it's time for us to stop trying to make it easier for people to get into the industry and time to focus on making it better to build software, especially for the more complex use cases. Like it's frustrating that we have Kubernetes and that's all we kind of have for running, you know, large scale microservices. And I don't really know if there's anybody that likes Kubernetes. Like the people that develop it, I haven't, any developers I've talked to, like they don't seem to like it. I don't think any DevOps people seem to like it. I don't think developers, I don't think people writing the software that runs on it like Kubernetes, but it's like the only thing that we have. And I think that comes from an underinvestment in this kind of more advanced space. Cause I think part of it is that people don't understand how the underlying things work. I mean, this is like part of my own journey where, you know, I thought I understood how networking works and I've recently picked up like the Cisco CCNA books and I've started reading through them and I'm like, I had no idea how networking works. It's humbling. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, oh, like the things IT people do, like I, I feel like IT is one of those spaces that's way far ahead of where we are in software. And I'm like, we got to go play catch up with them. Same thing with hardware people. It's like, we got to go play catch up with them. And I think we're still too, way too focused on being like, how do we just make it easier or other kind of oversimplifications of what we're doing? Like, I think the big argument with Russ always is like, oh, it's memory safety, it's memory safety, it's memory safety. I'm like, is that the thing that we really need to be focusing? I think it's important, but I think there's other things that are also important that we're not focusing on because we're so focused on this thing and this, you know, kind of making it easier to do very, very specific things. And I think there's other fires we, we should be focusing on putting out. That's, you know, that's interesting. I, I kind of agree. I think maybe we should be making it easier to learn how things like learn how the things work. I think that there's a, there's certainly a lot of arcane knowledge that doesn't need to be. And there are ways to kind of like user experience it and pretty it up to make it easier to digest and learn some of these like fundamental things. Like, you know, I think something that they're not all good, but I think this is an area where things like like a really good, you know, like a recurse center kind of thing or like, a you know, some kind of really good boot camp kind of thing might be able to kind of like fill in that niche and kind of get because like, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say that everybody needs to like study computer science. And I do think that there's probably room for two kinds of like developers, you know, like kind of the people who just want to make a living and don't really care. But, you know, I do, I also, I would agree that like a lot of that kind of lower knowledge is not only less known, but also maybe kind of inaccessible and needs to be better. We need to be better about that. So Chris, to put it into a soundbite, would you say we need to make it harder for beginners? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to help you achieve the unpopular yes. opinion. If, if we want it to be unpopular, <laughs> the, the quick bit is we should be making it harder for beginners and I'll pause there and then I will continue yeah. <laughs> by making it easier for people that are already established in the industry. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, and I do think that is a, that's a, that's a trade off there. Right. I don't think it is as simple as we can just invest in the more advanced stuff. I think the nature of doing that will likely make it more challenging for people that are just getting started as we shift toward these more, more complex things that like people should like after going through even just a little bit of CCNA, I'm like, yeah, no, every engineer should sit down and like go through this stuff. Like they should understand how networks work. That is, uh, I think, a, a very daunting task for someone that's just getting started in, in software engineering. But I think like, you know, we're, we're building network systems all of the time. I think it's important that we know. And I think there's other spillover too that I think people probably won't like to have to confront. Like one of the realizations I've made in the past couple of weeks is that there is no such thing in the modern day of non-distributed programming. Like all programming we're doing is distributed systems. Just the thing that people usually call distributed systems is too narrow. Like if you're programming on a machine with multiple cores and you're using mutexes and atomics or go routines or any of that, you are doing distributed systems programming. And there's distributed systems literature that directly addresses this. Like linearizability, which is a very the famous concept that gets talked about a lot and a lot of things databases try to achieve, that's actually a model for shared memory, which is a model for processors, to write multiple cores of your processors that talk to the same main memory module and making sure that all of that is synchronized. And so like you're using linearizable systems every single day, you just don't get to see it. But we hide a lot of that and we just don't teach people that and we don't frame it like that. But we really should be framing it like that. But once again, that will make it more difficult for beginners. Even academically, though, like um, like the classic model of memory is wrong, right? When you, you sort of bring cache lines and, and, you know, what do they call it? Uh, predictive execution in, right? Like it's, yeah, 
it's there's a lot that's there's a lot to cover, and I think that it would I think it would behoove us to have a, kind of a leveled indexed approach to like diving deep on certain things. So we just don't really yeah. I don't think we really have. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a it's a thing where I think we've gotten stuck. There's this uh, Peter Bayless has this post on his blog from from a few years back, a few years it was like eight years ago, but at this point from a few years back where he's basically making a plea to the database community to like, hey, we need to move forward from this you know idea of databases being this relational database management system. There's all these other types of database management or data management that we should be doing and all these different ways of of creating things. And I think in our effort to make things simpler. Any place that had like okay definitions or okay parameters for things, we just kind of latched on and kept those things. Like ACID is a big one. The, I'm reading the ACID paper now. One of the things about it is like it was just a plea to like really bring together these disparate terms, like because there really wasn't any any terms that were kind of bringing everything together. And it was like a do that. We have these terms now and move forward. Like ACID was like a, here's a here's a goal point. Move past it. Same thing with CAP. It's like here's a goal point. Move past it. And I think we kind of got stuck on all of those things. And I think part of it is ultimately because we wanted to make things simpler and easier. There's a very long winded, unpopular opinion. <laughs> it's going to be a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like it's going to be a little nice little snippet at the end of the episode too. Yeah. But yeah. So I, I, this was this was a great episode. I think we have like a ton of tools. Like these show notes are going to be going to be thick. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah. So uh, do either of you, Matt, Andy, have uh, any last words you want to say before we uh, sign off here? Uh, it's, I'll say I remember I remember the name of that terminal thingy emulator. It's called Zellij. It's like almost impossible to like say or type. It's Z E L L I J. We'll put that in there. And, uh, you know, yeah, be sure to, when it comes out, be sure to check out the second edition of Go in Action. That's, I'll say that, Manning Publications. <laughs> <laughs> Little book plug. Little plug, yeah. A what plug, did you say, A Chris? book plug. Book yeah, plug. Yeah, that's book what I heard. Plug. Yeah, definitely. Yes. <laughs> Big time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> A little fun at the end. Of yeah, a little bit of fun there for for the for the adults. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you, Matt, for for joining me as co-host here on this wonderful episode. My pleasure. And thank you, Andy, for for joining us again. Hope to have you back soon sometime. Oh, always a pleasure. All right, that is go time for this week. Thanks for hanging with us. If you're a first-time listener, subscribe now at gotime.fm. There you'll also find our recommended episodes, listener favorites, and a request form, so you can let us know what you want to hear about on the pod. Check it out. Once again, that's gotime.fm. And if you're a long-time listener, help us help more people on their gopher path by sharing GoTime with your friends and colleagues. Word of mouth is the number one way people find us. Thanks once again to our partners, Fastly.com, fly.io and typesense.org and thank you also to breakmaster cylinder for keeping our beat supply all topped up that's all for now but we'll talk to you again next time on go time